Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. The show bringing you quarantine content to enjoy interviews with my machine learning heroes about their journey. In this episode, I interview Emmanuel Amazin, who's a machine learning engineer at Stripe and the author of the O'Reilly book Building Machine Learning Powered Applications, Going from Idea to Product. That's the subtitle of the book. In this interview, as you can imagine, we talk about Emmanuel's journey. into machine learning and how his journey through different uh through the different roles led him to writing the book we talk all about the book in my opinion the book even though it's just 250 pages is one of the greatest resources for the title for building ml apps and also one of the greatest top down learning books that follow the top down teaching approach uh, that i very much learned from fast ai please do pick it up if you'd like to enjoy a great read during a quarantine physical isolation time we talk about who the book is really for what, what can you expect out of it emmanuel's journey of writing through the book and where to go after you've read the book how do you find your idea to take to product your passion project or your million dollar app idea either ways for both emmanuel says many great advices I feel this is a great interview covering all sorts of uh, advices in the realm of machine learning and building machine learning products building machine learning apps so I'm really excited to be sharing this interview with you without further ado here's my conversation with Emmanuel and as a reminder to the audience you can also go to YouTube and watch these interviews in the form of a video along with properly checked and re uploaded subtitles for non native english speakers and for people that would like to read about the data science terms if any that we go over so please feel free to go to the youtube channel for the podcast without further ado here's the conversation please enjoy the show Hi everyone I'm really excited to be talking to Emmanuel Amazin on the show today Emmanuel thank you so much for joining me on the podcast Thanks for having me Really excited to be finally talking to you so uh, like always I want to start by talking about your journey what uh, made you start your journey into machine learning I believe you have a background in math and then business uh, when did machine learning uh, become your passion Yeah um so that, that's right initially I Uh, you know, post uh, sort of high school education, I went towards math and then towards uh, engineering and electrical engineering. Um, and then when I was uh, working on my uh, E masters, I got kind of a little maybe disillusioned with the field in the sense that a lot of the technical work was compelling, but it kind of felt very old school. A lot of what I was learned was more about. <laughs> Uh, or what I was taught was more about sort of like the electrical engineering aspect rather than like maybe more modern things like how computer science works. Um, and so I remember thinking, oh, I, I'd like to have more sort of like an applied skill set, and that's why I decided to to go to business school. Uh, looking back on that, you know, the decision to sort of double major in electrical engineering and business, I'm not sure that I really got what I wanted out of it. I think business school was certainly informative, um, but as far as like finding meaning and giving meaning to your life, maybe not. a choice i'd recommend um yeah. and so it was while i was in business school that i was i was particularly bored in an hr class i remember and um and i actually uh, went online and i stumbled upon uh jeff hinton's lectures which he had on okay. coursera the 2011 like, uh, course right if, if i remember yes. correctly okay 
Yes, exactly. Um, I feel like a lot of people got their start from the Andrew Ng Coursera, but for me, it was Jeff Hinton's, although I checked out Andrew Ng's later. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I was fascinated. I thought that that was absolutely, uh, you know, he had a way of sort of explaining um, machine learning and the, the beginnings of deep learning as this sort of almost um, kind of, yeah, unexplainable, magical, you wouldn't even believe it thing. Like he would, I, re I sort of we had this sort of like model that would be fed um, relationships between like a family tree and then would infer, you know, like you, you would give it like a bunch of like, this is this person's father and this is this person's like sister. And then you would you'd like phrase a question in a way to say like, okay, like, then who's, who's the uncle of that person? And it would like figure it out <laughs> without you ever having like, hard coded any of the rules. I was like, oh wow, this is crazy. Um, and so shortly thereafter, I decided to switch back and actually, so I was already double doing a master in, in uh, electrical engineering and a master in uh, business. And I was like, well, AI actually seems really interesting. And so I, um, I signed up for like a research master's in artificial intelligence and worked a little bit on uh, deep learning, a little bit of optimization. And actually my master's thesis was mostly focused on uh, multi-agent simulations, which is not okay. a thing that's like very explored outside of RL, I guess. But um, yeah, that was just really interesting to me. Um, and after I did that, I decided that machine learning was really fun. And that's when I, I moved from France where I'm from to, to the Valley. Uh, and I started my, my career as a data scientist at a startup called Locomotion that then was acquired by Zipcar. Okay. Now I sort of want to jump forward to Zipcar where you were working as a data scientist and this will help me segue later into talking about the book that you've written. But uh, I was I was going through LinkedIn, which if I may is also a resume and you mentioned you also were involved in the front end and back end. That, that isn't the sexiest thing to at least data science aspirants. Uh, you were a data scientist working on front end, back end tech. Uh, can, can you maybe uh, explain a bit about the importance of even being involved in these things while still working on the data science side? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, th th that's not how I'd say my first few months on the job were. My first few months were very much more on like the, the data science sort of like algorithmic side and optimization. Um, you know, I worked on sort of various uh, jobs, uh, one algorithm that would take uh, GPS data and try to recompute um, itineraries and trajectories because GPS data is like super noisy. And so you need to actually do some signal processing to, you know, from just a bunch of GPS points, uh, get the, tre the, the, the streets that a car went through, for example. So like very like, data science-y stuff. But then in a few of these projects, uh, what I found is I think what a lot of other data scientists have found in their careers and what's been the fuel for many Medium articles, which is that getting the data uh, in the correct format or like even having access to the data. Uh, and then I think at Zipcar, even more importantly, uh, once we had a model, like taking actions based on that model, serving this model to users, even internal users was always the biggest challenge. It was a big challenge because it sort of like didn't fit within the traditional maybe like uh, sprint planning that you'd have at these kind of orgs where, you know, uh, what we really needed is support from like engineering to actually integrate our, our models in production. And that was something that uh, at the time we didn't really have. And so due to that, uh, I ended up growing very frustrated and then ended up sort of, uh, you know, bothering engineers that were more skilled than me and asking them to like hold my hand as I was trying to learn how to do front end and how to do back end and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, they were, uh, super kind and super helpful and, and sort of just helped me actually uh, get our, our products shipped across the, the line. And this was like, you know, I, I did front end, uh, just to be clear, not for uh, the Zipcar website. Uh, very wisely, they wouldn't let me get close to that one, but it was for more, you know, internal tools uh, where we'd have tools for, you know, uh, our contractors, for example, that would service cars. And so we needed to display predictions to them in a way that they could access it from their phones or from their laptops. And so that was the front end that I was working on. Got it. Now, again, I'm, I'm sort of again jumping forward because I can't wait to talk about the book, but uh, you later joined Insight Fellows. Uh, I also want to discuss your journey from, uh, I believe you were one of the first fellows, the first batch in the uh, student mentees that they had taken up your journey from there to becoming the lead and your takeaways from later mentoring so many students. Yeah. Um, so I, I was uh, part of the first session uh, of the AI program, but actually Insight was older than that and had been operating for years, I think since 2012, I believe, uh, for their data science program. Um, but they had just started the AI program. And, you know, as I was working uh, at Zipcar, I sort of had decided that 
I wanted to, to get a new role and potentially a role that was closer to, uh, I guess what was called AI at the time, which was mostly sort of like a little bit of deep learning research um, with the hope of it being applied. Uh, that was back in <laughs> 2017. And so most people, you know, thought that you just hire a bunch of smart people, they do like a bunch of deep learning research and then somehow it would like make it into your product uh, and you'd make millions. Didn't exactly turn out that way uh, in terms of how AI was shipped, but that's that's a story for another time. But yeah, I, I joined and I was part of the program and I loved it. And I joined because I wanted um, what Insight offers, which is Insight uh, gives you this opportunity to one, work on a project for a month and get to dive deep into a topic. And so I did some um, style transfer for audio, which was still to this day, one of the most fun projects I've ever worked on. And then you get to actually, um, you know, the whole goal of Insight is to uh, introduce you to, to companies that you could work at. And so you get to like have discussions with all of the team members of these companies. And so that was just extremely fun to have all these conversations and really see what these teams were doing. Like, you know, because opposed to what they have on their job board, you actually got to talk to the data scientist or the ML engineer and be like, no, like in your day to day, what do you do? What do you spend most of your time on? What are your big problems? And that was, that was extremely informative. And so it turned out that, uh, when they did ask me to join the team, uh, I, I valued that experience so much, like the experience of getting to talk to a variety of people that were at all these teams and learning what they do. I felt like I learned so much so fast that I jumped on the opportunity to, to help with the program uh, because it was just such a great opportunity to see a lot very quickly, more breadth over depth, if you will. And so, yeah, I, I, jo I joined. Um, I sort of grew the AI program from... Uh, where it started to uh, a much larger program over uh, two years, it eventually ended up leading the team that was um, taking care of it. And, uh, and through that work, got to chat with like dozens and dozens of companies that were doing applied machine learning and mentor um, hundreds of students uh, or fellows. And I think that was, yeah, still like the pace of learning at, the, at Insight was incredible because you very quickly pattern match once you've seen, you know, not one NLP project, but like, 25 or not yeah. one uh, image classification project but 30 and so that was that was an amazing experience awesome and I, I believe you mentored a lot of people uh, did you see any common pitfalls I believe this was this might have been the groundwork for you also leading to the book uh, any common pitfalls any common takeaways from mentoring so many people yeah um, there definitely were um, and that was <laughs> definitely a motivation both for the book and for um, writing you know uh online in general i think i'm not gonna have to, to convince you i think you're you're very much on board but like blogging uh i, I got really into blogging during my time at insight because it it felt like a um a very good way to share the lessons i'd learned uh you know there's a common saying that if you if you explain something or write an email twice uh, you should probably write a blog post about it and that was very much that and so yeah there, there were a lot of common pitfalls i'd say that there's probably too many to discuss all of them, but um, there were a few that I think are, are just wildly applicable to machine learning projects even today. And that was that uh, uh, one, uh, fellows often, and practitioners in general, kind of focus a lot on the methods, on the, on the how, and, and less on the why. And, and you know, that means that like, when you have an initial conversation about like what projects they should work on, whether it's at a company or whether it's for their startup or whether it was at Insight, they'd often say like, oh, well, you know, like I wanna work with transformers or, you know, I wanna do reinforcement <laughs> learning or, you know, and, and that always like makes a lot of sense, right? These techniques are exciting, but it actually, I found out never worked to sort of start from the method and say like, okay, well, I wanna do reinforcement learning and then try like find some, some problem you know, that could justify you doing it. Cause it, it was always obvious to whoever you would talk to later that it was like, oh, you're not actually solving this problem. Like you just yeah. shoehorn this random thing into your technique. And so one of, one of the, the biggest shortfalls was like, if a project didn't start with like an actual purpose, then it would almost never succeed. Uh, because, you know, what you'd find is if you want to use reinforcement learning to solve something, and then in the course of solving it, you realize that actually you could solve it better with something else. Well, what you really should do is you should do the something else, but your whole goal was to use reinforcement learning. So you're probably going to just do your reinforcement learning thing. And then the people that see your work are just going to say like, well, I, I guess this is interesting, but in general, they hire you for your ability to solve problems, not your ability to use techniques. And I'll definitely judge you because you solved, you didn't solve a problem or you solved it in an underwhelming fashion. So that was a big one. There's two other ones that I think are, um, 
crucial. Um, the second one is very related, which was starting with the simplest thing. Uh, this is something that I harp on in my book. This is something that many uh, program directors before me at Insight, uh, you know, would, would harp on about. And it's that usually for any given project, you should build something that's just as complicated as you need and not, not any more complicated. The MVP um, of sorts so that you can pitch to your manager. Exactly. Right. Like in the, in the entrepreneurship uh, world, <laughs> have, like this is not new, right? Yeah, of course there's yeah. like the classic MVP and, and, you know, there's like a bunch of diagrams and books on the topic and machine learning. It's, it's the same. The reason why that might've not been clear is a lot of uh, the field of machine learning I, I, is full of newcomers because it's a very exciting field. And when you're a newcomer, you often want to show that you actually can do the complicated thing. And so you'd have this failure mode where you'd have somebody that's new to the field and I would say like, oh, well, you know, for this sort of like classification problem, I'm going to do this kind of crazy thing where I'm like embedding all these images, using an LP, like doing this like very intense thing where, you know, you could have like used fast AI and done like transfer learning and gotten like a really good classification model pretty quickly. And they did this not because they liked making their lives hard. They did this because they, their understanding both from being new to the field and from seeing fancy blog posts from like fancy companies was that that was what was going to get them noticed, right? That like, if you go to like a hiring manager, a company and you say like, Hey, look, you know, I've built this like really elaborate system. They'd say like, Oh my God, we need to hire this person. They can do the hard stuff. But in reality, uh, that's something that, that hiring managers get just a bunch of, they get a lot of these very complicated <laughs> projects. When I was, um, you know, interviewing fellows for, uh, insight, we would interview like thousands of fellows every session. We would have no shortage of complex projects. W what mm -hmm. there was a shortage of was somebody that like would, would take a project and would say like, actually, you see this project, you may think that it's complicated, but I found a way to frame it in just a simple way. And then my model is like very simple and it works and it's reliable and it's resilient. And it took me a couple of weeks. And that person, every time the fellows that actually do this would just be the ones that, you know, like would be successful, would get all the interviews and all the callbacks. And so it was like a bias towards simplicity, which again is obvious in other fields, but not so much in machine learning. That was this sort of like potential pitfall um, for, from, from fellows. And then there was the last one, which was uh, simply uh, iterating. It's linked to the simplicity, but there was basically two ways that people would go, would go around their projects, which is one would be, uh, again, this like complex approach. And then what that means is like, if your project is say a month, you'll spend a month getting it to work. And maybe like by the end of the month, you'll have something that works and it kind of doesn't work just right, but you spend your whole month on it and so you just have to figure out a way to pitch it. Or you have the, the folks that worked on something simple and then they could do the experimental approach of saying like, okay, like now I have this simple object, a simple, you know, like model I've built or the simple thing. I've, I've made and they could say like, ah, this part, this part is the one that is the worst. I'm going to spend a week on this part. And then they would like do it again. And they'd be like, okay, now I have my version two of this thing. Ah, now this part's good. This other part, that's what I need to fix. And those projects would be much more impressive because they would tell such a longer and more detailed story, right? You'd say like, well, you know, in four weeks, I've actually built like three different versions and those three different versions solve these very specific problems. Um, yeah. and, and learning to do that was, was how you success, succeeded. Makes sense. I, I've definitely been guilty of chasing the bigger, <laughs> extremely biggest model I could ever make. I think that yeah. that's one mistake every one of us makes. It, yes. To be honest, it's really about how much value can you provide to the company you're working at. That's that's where uh, the huge salaries in machine learning lie. And people often miss out on the fact that if you try telling your manager that, hey, I'm going to make a state of the art model and it'll take me 15 days. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's completely fine to play with fancy models, right? To your point, everybody's done it. But as long as you're honest with yourself and you're saying like, hey, this is mostly probably like prototyping slash, you know, learning or throwaway work. I'm going to try to like replicate this transformer architecture just because I want to know how it works. And that's fine. Um, but it's very different from the kind of skills you want to demonstrate to yeah, deliver uh, at a company that you're working at or uh, show to a potential company interviewing you that you're a high quality hire. Yeah. Now, uh, coming to where you're currently working at, uh, Stripe, your role as a machine learning engineer, uh, Stripe is a payment company, if I may. Where does machine learning come into the picture of payments? Uh, it's just transactions. How, how is machine learning involved? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good question. I think there's many, well, I, I know there's many parts of Stripe that, that use um, machine learning, and some might be more obvious than others. 
one, uh, one nice distinction that you can think of is uh, Stripe is a company that helps merchants process payments. And so there's two sides to that. There's merchants and payments. And so we have um, machine learning teams that focus on detecting, um, think like bad actors or account takeovers for merchants. So, you know, e either a merchant that's trying to sign up for something that's not allowed on Stripe. Um, you know, there's lists of businesses that are forbidden on Stripe, trying to detect that automatically. You can build models to address that. Or you also have um, the payment side. That's the side that I'm working on, which is, you know, Stripe processes very many payments a day. Mm -hmm. And not all of those payments are uh, by their uh, rightful card holder um, or, or, you know, the person that actually uh, wanted to initiate the payments. Some payments are due to, you know, somebody stealing a credit card or um, stealing somebody's information. And uh, Stripe actually has a product called Radar, which helps merchants that use Stripe automatically detect these fraudulent payments. And so you can imagine that you have like a very uh, classic machine learning problem here where you have, you know, the vast majority of payments on Stripe that you want to happen just as they are. And then you have like a small, very, very, very small fraction of payments that is uh, illegitimate, but that you want to block. You want to block them because, you know, they're essentially the result of theft usually. And so uh, it's, it's like the needle in the haystack problem of machine learning. Yeah. It's the opposite of the ones that you usually have in the books, right? Usually in the books, you have like a very nice 50-50 uh, split between your classes. But here you have this, this like very, very, very small fraction of, of cases that you need to catch and you need to catch them with a, a very low false positive rate, right? Because if you use Stripe and I start just blocking your normal transactions, then you're not gonna wanna use Stripe anymore. <laughs> and so that's like a very interesting problem because it combines sort of like a, a pretty hard, like a classification problem, but, but in a pretty hard framing, like the stakes are very high. And um, an aspect that I think is starting to get uh, considered more and more in machine learning, which is heavy engineering requirements. Like because it's on every transaction, you have to have a model that will be highly available and that you know will not fall over and that will be able to score in transactions fast enough that like you can actually buy whatever it is that you're buying online. I guess I'd like to call it the parental control by my bank. Whenever I try to buy something internationally, it always blocks my transactions and annoys mm -hmm. me very much. <laughs> for example, yeah. even even it blocked my payment for your book. <laughs> which, which it was, did? Yes, oh. unfortunately. <laughs> Unacceptable. See, this is why you need a good team of machine learning engineers. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and some of these are, uh, are hard problems. A lot of um, banks in the world use like heuristics, right? Where it's like, well, this cardholder is from this country and they're buying something in another country. Let's just block it. But to your point, when you're taking a vacation, that's terrible. And you, you, know, you don't want that to happen. And so it, it actually takes some much more sophisticated, uh, both data processing and like machine learning models to actually be able to tease out, you know, what's, what is um, an unusual payment. And I, I think uh, so many people assume that, hey, this has been going on for so many years. We have credit cards. Even before machine learning, why isn't this a solved problem? It's like like you pointed out, needle in a haystack, the cases are so less. The class imbalance, if I may, is, is completely off the charts. Yeah, it's the class imbalance definitely makes it tough because regardless of how easy the problem is, if if you have a wild class imbalance, you're going to have to work pretty hard to get a model that has like you know perfect recall and no false positives that's that is uh, uh, very much unsolved and there's also it's it there, there's sort of um one thing i talk about in the book is that for most machine learning problems you have an irreducible error like it, it's unreasonable to expect that you know even if, if we were to hire all machine learning practitioners and give them infinite budget and and let them do whatever they want uh, that that you'd be able to catch all fraud, right? Mm -hmm. If you think of of you know like your buying patterns, maybe you're you're a person that mostly uses you know your credit card to buy books on Amazon, and then let's say maybe you drop your credit card uh, at some cafe, and I'm I'm a mean thief, and actually I'm also a mean thief that loves books. So I steal your credit card, you know I live close to where you live, and I also buy a book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Like that's I don't know how you detect that, right? Like it's same card, same kind of purchase from the same location. Um, provided you haven't reported your card, that's very hard to detect uh, proactively. And so there's, there's always going to be like some amount of fraud, right, that you can imagine is just going to happen and is just not something that you can classify. 
And, and even the question of saying like, well, what is this amount? Is a question yeah. that you could sort of spin up a, a, a research team on. So, because it's not easy. It's not easy to even know what you should aim for. Actually, funnily, I, I remember an instance I was in New York uh, for my Google interview, which I absolutely failed. <laughs> but I swiped, I swiped my card at uh, the hotel and I got a call from my bank saying, hey, have you swiped the card at the hotel that you supposed to say uh, stay at? I, I, I had given my itinerary to them. And I actually ended up asking them, why are you asking me this question? Uh, they gave me the same response. Since it was just a transaction of $200, we were worried if it, it was stolen because that, that's not an amount you'd pay in a New York hotel. Oh, interesting. Yeah, exactly. Any sort of like outlier, you know, you, you, can, you can look at it and you can say like, well, obviously they should have seen that this is fraud. This is much more expensive than you usually buy. But then when you buy your TV, you're very happy that your, you know, your bank doesn't like immediately ban your card because it's yeah. more expensive than what you usually buy. Makes sense. Now, coming to the book, it's titled Machine Learning Powered Applications Going from Idea to Product. Now, when I was young, I would think you write a book, it takes you a few days and you become this famous superstar. <laughs> but now I've come to realize that it does take a lot of effort. It's, it's really a service to the community, if I may, uh, because you're really teaching them at least much better than university in a much more recent fa fashion. And it does take a lot of effort. Why did you decide to uh, write a book, uh, go along that path? Yeah, uh, that's, that's, uh, I, I'm amazed that you, you thought that writing a book took a couple of days. I think I underestimated the effort, but man, a couple of days, that'd be impressive. Um, although I was reading about an author just today that apparently manages to write 80 pages a day, which is, which is crazy well, and much faster than I, than I write. Um, to answer your question, I think, so initially, uh, I got started by writing these blog posts, right? As a consequence of a lot of these common, like, errors slash pitfalls. So there, so there were, you know, like, a bunch of projects I saw that were around natural language processing. And I said, well, okay, all of these projects are essentially trying to classify I'm sorry, text. Wait, can we read these if, if you want to right now? Can we read these blog posts? Are they still up? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, so you can read them at two different locations. Uh, they're on the official blog of Insight Data Science, but they're also on my personal website, which is the same as my uh, Twitter handle. So if you go to mlpowered.com, okay. all the blog posts are here and you can sign up. You know, I have a notification list. So you can sign up and you just get the, the future blog post in your inbox as I, as I publish them. Awesome. Um, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so, yeah, I started with these blog posts uh, and the blog post started from like, oh, here are common errors. Like, I'm going to just teach you, like, if you're classifying text, honestly, you can use this sort of like cookie cutter approach. You know, it won't solve all your problems, but it'll solve most of your problems. And you should probably start there. And, you know, I did one for NLP. I did one for uh, computer vision as well. And the reception to those was honestly uh, amazing. It, it felt so heartwarming. I kind of wrote them mostly as a, as a way to coalesce my thoughts initially. But then, you know, folks from all over the world would say like, Hey, you know, I was working on this really, uh, like hard project either, either like personally or, or for my company and I was stuck. And then I saw your blog post and, and like, it actually got me unstuck. And so like, thanks, you know, it's really cool that, that you wrote that. And, and that made me really happy. And I was like, Oh wow. It, actually it has a, a multiplier effect, right? It's almost like I can like make little clones of myself that then go talk to all these people that, I, yeah. you know, I don't even know where they, where they live and, and it can tell them like, you know, well, in my opinion, you should do this. Um, and so that was, that was the motivation for writing the book. I wanted to do that, but in a more thorough manner, um, in a manner where I could actually like, cover all of the topics. And so that's why I wanted to write the book. Um, but that's not the whole reason. The reason, the other reason that was important is I felt like until recently, um, there was a, a, a disconnect between the resources that would teach you machine learning and what hiring companies would want and what would make you successful at your job. And I saw this every day uh, at my previous job at Insight where you know, folks would read sort of like either very math heavy, sort of like very theoretical books, or they would read very fancy blog posts from like, you know, companies that are saying like, oh, we're using like reinforcement learning to do uh, auto ML on this thing. Um, and so that's what they would study. That's what they would focus on. And then we'd talk to hiring managers at the same companies that were pushing these blog posts. And they'd say like, no, honestly, we, you know, 
if they know how to do a linear regression, we really just care about them being good engineers. And we're like, hold on, like there's like this huge disconnect where you're saying like what I really value is like these engineering skills and these like product focused skills that will get you to build ML applications fast. Whereas like all of the candidates have been reading the blogs that you've been putting out that are saying like, no, 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 no. Like go like publish a crazy paper, like beat the state of the art and ImageNet, that sort of stuff. And it's not to say that like, the, the more academic approach is wrong. It has its place and it's, it's gotten us to where we are, but it just was, was kind of used as a way to get into the field when it shouldn't have been. And so I wanted to write a book that would help two kinds of people, the people that wanted to get into the field and the people that just wanted to use machine learning for their products, for their startups, for their current company. And it felt like there wasn't a book that specifically, um, kind of focused on that. And so it, since it was missing and since I felt like that was a lot of my day job, I decided to write that book. Certainly. Uh, and uh, so uh, my, my naivety of the assumption that book doesn't take a lot of days came from, if you already have a bunch of great blog posts, it, it just really takes compiling them into a book. Can you talk a bit more about the process? How, how did you find it? Yeah. I mean, having written blog posts is definitely helpful, at least to the extent that you've like, started the process of getting your thoughts out. Um, the whole process of writing a, a book, I would say, is um, I, 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 when I started writing it, I talked to other O'Reilly authors and I asked them about, you know, like, how was it for you to write this book? And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't mind uh, me sharing this. I talked to uh, Pete Warden, who wrote a great book about tiny ML, uh, machine learning yes. on embedded devices. And he told me it's about whatever your estimate is, it's about at least twice as hard as you think it will be. <laughs> and, you know, I said, oh, that's fine. So I doubled my estimate. Uh, and I would say it was about twice as hard as that doubled estimate. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, how the world works. It seems to me like it beats the laws of mathematics, but no matter how many times you double your estimate, it'll still be twice as hard as that. Mm -hmm. um, and it took a while. It took about 18 months from start to finish. Um, the, the whole process of writing a book is very different from blog posts because the feedback loop is, is, is like kind of long and writing 250 pages in a way where every page is informative is actually, um, it, it's not easy, right? Because there's a, tempt a, a temptation, especially because you want to like get all your thoughts out to just like write, 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 write. But then by doing that, you're doing a bit of a disservice to your readers in the sense that this isn't sort of like a, a fiction novel. This is supposed to be a book that teaches you machine learning. So, I, you know, I don't want there to just be like fluff where I kind of like ramble on for like six pages. I wanted every page to have an impact. And so it was a bit disheartening because I would write like 50 pages and I would cut them down to, to 20 and I would do that again. And then it takes a while, you know, if you're always cutting down your pages. And so that was the part that was maybe the, the, the longest. Once I had a final draft of the book, then we did a sort of like a tech review process, but that part is much easier because then, you know, you have, we had like very uh, qualified data scientists read through the book, tell me what they thought. And then I could address, you know, all of their questions or comments, you know, anything that they noticed that wasn't accurate, um, I could fix. And, and that was much easier. Uh, the real hard part is getting all the information to make 250 useful pages. That's, that's <laughs> tough. It was tough for me. Okay. Uh, no, so Jeremy, Jeremy Howard mentioned your book in the upcoming fast AI lectures and I looked it up. I was like, okay, this is just 250 pages. I can finish this in a week. And that was me just being overconfident. I, I'm still in the first few chapters, <laughs> if, if anyone is wondering. So uh, who, who is, is the book really for? Uh, do I need to be an expert? Do I need to be a machine learning practitioner in order to pick up? Because it, it titles taking applications to, to a product. And do, do I absolutely need to know every nit and grit of machine learning in order to be able to pick it up? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. First of all, I, you know, I hope you get through the book and you enjoy it. Um, please let me know if you don't, you know, I'll get you a refund. But um, <laughs> I've been absolutely enjoying it. Okay, good. Um, there's, there's a few things here, which is, it's, you know, when, when you write a book, part of the book proposal is, is they ask you sort of like what your audience is. Um, and Every book author, I think at some point, just wants to answer everyone. It's like, oh, well, you know, everybody would benefit from my book. It's great. You should all read it. Um, but you do need to, to your point, to narrow down on a, on a set of uh, folks that would benefit from it. My, uh, my two audiences that I mentioned a little earlier, you know, were uh, folks that were transitioning into uh, ML and wanted to learn about it, or folks that just wanted to use ML for practical purposes. And those don't always have the same background. 
In fact, what I found is a lot of readers that have been sending me, you know, email or writing reviews are readers that are data scientists and ML engineers. And they're like, oh, I was stuck on this particular project or I was stuck on this problem. I read your book and it made me think about it differently and give me like a few comparisons, a few tips. And I like had a breakthrough and actually managed to ship this project. Uh, I mentioned this because they weren't the, as much the intended audience for the book. So that was a big surprise for me. And I was really happy that it was valuable. Uh, the intended audience and a lot of the other comments I've been getting is, again, folks that don't necessarily need to know any prerequisites. Uh, all of the parts where you actually need prerequisites, where it says like, oh, you know, like, here, use a random forest. And maybe you're like, well, I have no idea what a random forest is, are written so that you can kind of just skip them. Uh, there's code examples that are also written so that you can skip them. Um, you know, I've had, I've asked a friend that, that doesn't know uh, like Python at all, like to, to read through it and, and, you know, to tell me if there was any part that like wouldn't make sense if you skip the code examples. And they were like, no, 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 this actually you get a lot of value from reading the book, even if you just skip all the code examples. And so as much as possible, I tried to minimize prerequisites. And that was a conscious decision because again, I felt like the other problem of the existing literature is like, you know, you, you're like, oh, I want to learn about machine learning. And you're like, okay, you open your machine learning book. And then the first thing is like, oh, you know, like, calculus like what do i remember from calculus like nothing and you're like okay well i just want to classify images and they're like no 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 like you first you have to be able to derive back prop from scratch and then maybe you can classify images and so yeah. you know you mentioned jeremy Ho howard i like very much respect um and admire his approach like it's very much something similar that i wanted to do where it's like no like it, it makes no sense that you should have all these prerequisites like you're welcome to dive into them if you do discover like if you have a passion for machine learning but for this book um honestly it's aimed for folks that are have an interest in machine learning and that are computer literate. So th th this is more of a fad moment, but uh, Jeremy calls it the top down approach. And uh, usually because I am the laziest person, I usually skip forward from the code sections, come back to them later when I'm in the, when I, I've just woken up in the morning and I'm having chai, then, then I enjoy coding. And I was absolutely able to, to your book. And I, I just realized that it's because your book really, also follows the top-down approach. So th thanks, thank you for creating one of those very unique books. That's I'm I'm glad to hear it. Uh, similar to Jeremy, I, I learned personally in a top-down manner, just like you. So I'm glad that that it follows that well. So what all do you cover in the book? Uh, for someone who's just picking it up, can will they will will they be able to ship every single type of machine learning model into production? What all can they expect from it? I mean, that would be the greatest sell, right? If I could just tell you, yes, this, you just throw away all the other books and courses. This is the only one you need. Um, no, you, you, you'll definitely, I, I throw some references, you know, um, in the intro for sort of like follow-up um, topics and, and the book does link to other books that, that could help with, with different parts. But it does aim to cover every part. I'd say it, it aims to cover sort of like the breadth of ML and then to give you like, hey, if you want to dive deeper into like actually deploying applications, like you probably want to read this other book. Uh, but it covers, what, what it covers is sort of like four big parts, which is first, the, um, the intersection between sort of like product thinking and uh, machine learning. And that's something where uh, that is too often skipped and it is too often the differentiator between like a project that lasts for four months and then fails and a project that is just like shipped in two weeks is, you know, you have some, some uh, product manager or like your CEO or, or yourself that has like a, a vision for a feature, like you want to accomplish a thing. And then usually uh, depending on what you choose for your algorithm or what you choose for your data set, uh, it'll be very easy or very hard. The first part is all about helping you make the best decision so that you can just progress as fast as possible. Um, the second part is all about uh, actually like exploring and looking at your data. That's also a part that either is skipped or all the data scientists skip, uh, or I mean, complain about. They're like, ah, 95% of my job is just, you know, looking at data. And, uh, and there's no reason that it should be that way. You actually learn the most from looking at your data set. And so it's, it's just gives you various tools like, um, gather a data set, inspect it, try to see whether a model will actually learn from it. Um, once you're done with that, the whole third part is about iteration. Back to the pitfalls that I talked about. A lot of maybe uh, less experienced folks are, they focus on, on, on the, um, the machine learning uh, task as if it was linear. You know, they say, okay, well, First, you know, you get uh, the, the goal, you get a data set, you train a model, you evaluate it, you're done. But almost every single machine learning project is a loop where mm -hmm. you do very many iterations of, you know, 
uh, look at your project, train a model, get some results, and then maybe you retrain the model. When you retrain the model, you're like, okay, now it, trains, it performs better. And then maybe you realize that like, you have a crucial feature that's missing. So you add like, you do some feature engineering, you add a feature, and then you realize that maybe like, your product's not quite right. So you change like, what kind of predictions you make, et cetera. So the whole third part is that, is like the iteration of loop of machine learning and how to speed that up. And finally, the last part is, you know, once you've actually decided that uh, your model is good enough to ship, what are your options to ship it? Um, what are different paradigms that you can use? Uh, and, and sort of like, how should you think both about how to ship it and how to, how to ship it uh, like safely and reliably? Uh, there's a lot, you know, once you start shipping models that customers actually use, there's a lot of things you have to keep in mind when you want to update a model or even when you want, just want to check that your model isn't going completely bonkers and, and kind of breaking everywhere. And so that's what the fourth part is about. And so it's everything, but obviously, you know, for each of these parts, you can like write a whole book about. And, and mm -hmm. whenever I found such books, I try to link to them so that you can, you can dive deeper if you so wish. Awesome. Uh, do, do you have any advice for how fast should be your iteration? Uh, Radek Osmalski, I just want to give a shout out to his technique. Uh, as much as I love watching the loss values go down, I, I'd be happy to debate with anyone who's uh, a machine learning practitioner. You're not a real practitioner unless you wasted hours just watching the loss curves. But <laughs> what, what's, what's your take on how fast should be the iteration group? Uh, Radik mentions that when you're interactively working on models, that should be around 30 to 60 seconds because after that you lose your attention. Uh, any any uh, thoughts there? How far should you iterate on having the first model ready, then going back to inspecting your data set and following that too? Yeah. Um, so I, I agree. I think, uh, I don't know about 30 to 60 seconds. I think that depends probably on, on you know, yeah. if, if you can, that's great. Sometimes, you know, if, if you're training, uh, on a giant data set that might not be possible. So I, I mean, uh, to, to elaborate on that 30 seconds, when yeah. you're just starting out on the smallest uh, possible subset of your data set, then the loops should be around 30 seconds because that'll allow you to think properly and not go into the uh, trap of control T. Let me go to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or they're like, you know, what are you doing? Oh, the thing's compiling. Like, I'm just going to go for a walk. Um, <laughs> oh, my model's training. I can just go like, you know, cook a steak or something. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so I actually have, have little to add except to say that, yes, you should make your feedback loop as short as possible. And in fact, in the, in the third part that I talked about in um, the uh, iteration, one thing I, I talk about is like one way to do that is to, to think of um, three, six, like uh, almost the, the like uh, a hierarchy of, of like building your own project. So in other words, your first goal should be to have your data go all the way through to your model and to have your model, like even an untrained model, just kind of like output a prediction. And for that, you need like, you know, if it's tabulated, like a couple rows or a couple images or a couple sentences. And so for that, it should in fact be extremely fast. And at that point, you know, you're, you're debugging sort of like tensor size mismatches or like you're, you're like some pre-processing function is outputting something of the wrong format. And so that's like very quick and you're just like getting the data through. Once that's done, you want to check that you can um, overfit on a single example. And that's something that, that is an advice that's been shared by many ML folks. For me, it was uh, Ross Fadley from Inside actually that, that told me that for the first time. And that's something that I now swear by. It's like once, once you can like, get data all the way through, you just train your model on one example and you see that you can get the loss you know, to, to zero basically. And then you know, if that doesn't work, you know you have a problem somewhere. Uh, and so you don't need to use your, your whole data set. You can stay on this like, you know, couple example um, regime and just figure out what's going on. And then once that happens, then you can actually train your model on a reasonable data set and validate it. And so obviously for the first two parts, I agree, like honestly, your feedback loop should probably be even way shorter than 30 seconds. It's really in the order of a, of a few seconds. And then for that last part, that's where, you know, you, you maybe jump down the rabbit hole of YouTube and, and listen to some good podcasts, but uh, yeah. For, for the first few parts, you want that feedback loop to be extremely short. Awesome. Uh, so the, the next question is sort of another issue that happens with top-down learning is to just be able to trust uh, the teacher. I, I think you pick up an NLP uh, project or example in the book. Uh, how will I be later able to apply this to computer vision? Uh, any thoughts there? I, I know that you are giving very rich advice in the book. But the part of me that's a bottom-up learner, thanks to university, also also makes me worried. I need to Google this up. I need to know this. How do I do this? 
what are your thoughts there yeah uh that's a super good question because i think especially if you're somebody that's interested okay oh, so i'd say there's two things if you're interested in building a computer vision app for a particular purpose you want to build you know a, a hot dog or not hot dog. Hmm? hot dog or not hot dog app for example exactly a hot dog or not hot dog um or you want to do you know like just anything where you try to recognize something in an image i would argue that you'd still i mean i i wrote it so obviously i'm biased but that you you should still maybe like start with a book and you get a lot of value from it because the book will help you like get to your end goal faster so like regardless of your method it's it's not that much about nlp as much as it is about building ml powered applications however if your interest is you know diving deep into the world of computer vision and understanding like okay well you know how does a cnn model classify images then i i would recommend going for a resource that focuses on that um you know in in other words if you're trying to get uh, a deep understanding and in fact for the matter even of nlp or of computer vision or of reinforcement learning there are resources that are dedicated to teaching you that and a lot of the time they they they're bottom up resources and they're very good but if you're looking uh to be a better practitioner that ships things faster and more efficiently then the whole point of the book is that it tries to make that advice as uh, generalizable to any you know data set uh, slash model that you may have i do dive into sir sort of like specific here's how you'd vectorize images you know using a pretrained model here's how you do that stuff but i'd say like most of the value is in um fine tuning that process so you you become like this like machine learning machine that can like more quickly um frame your problem the right way quickly get a data set quickly iterate quickly test it quickly deploy it um as opposed to you know learning more about a specific domain got it this this also one unique thing in the book ci cd and testing now to me as a young ml practitioner i would have never heard of these things can you can you give us a teaser of <laughs> where these are used in the ml pipeline and also in the book uh, what what all do you cover in this area yeah it's always something you don't think about until you're the person that has to fix you know everything that broke and then uh, you know after cursing your past self for a while <laughs> you you decide to focus on it a little more uh it's still new for you know like ci cd for um software engineering uh, has a bit of history behind it and and is now better understood i'd say for machine learning there's still a lot of paradigms that are being currently discovered but there there are things that are worth doing um more specifically uh you could do everything that you do normally for software engineering and that a lot of a lot of books have been written about that and i like to some of them but then there's a few different things when you have models so when you have models uh, your models kind of only as good as the data it was trained on right and that means that of course you should be careful about the data it was trained on and that's part of the second part of the book about training the data set but it's also uh something that you should think about when you ship your model right uh there's many errors slash tragedies that are due to training your model on a certain kind of data set and then trying to run inference on another kind of data set right if you only have folks of you know a given uh skin color in your training data uh it will only work for folks of that given color in your app and that could be terrible most likely yeah so there's there's like of course like you can have like the product thinking to think about it proactively but you can also just like monitor that and be alerted if that happens and so like a simple way to do that is you can just look roughly at the distributions of your features um mm-hmm. in production and compare them to the distributions you trained on and so that's something i i um give a few tools with uh using a library called a uh, great expectations where you can you know sort of simply say like okay well here's what you know the mean and median values of these various things were in my training set or even like distribution and like i want to check that we're within you know a reasonable bound of these and that means that you will be alerted if that's not the case and the reason that that's super important is because your model will run no matter what data it's fed and so one of the biggest mistakes i see is like oh well you know like the model's still running still making prediction and it's like yeah but if like your distribution is completely chained it it's basically you have like a random number generator in production and you're just like you know patting yourself on the back saying like oh we shipped ml but essentially you have this like random box of garbage that's just like outputting random stuff and ideally you'd like to catch that before your customers complain and so there's both 
those tests on um, the, the data distribution. And then you can also just look at your model's outputs. Similarly, um, if your model is a classifier and it's starting to always output something close to like 50%, there's something like that that may be a foot. If it's um, you know starting to output always one class, whereas like it used to be pretty balanced, there's something that's a foot. And um, and one of the things that you can do in that case is you can have what's what's called a filtering model, which is you now have another machine learning model that tries to decide whether you should run your model, like your your real model. This is something that's used, for example. Uh, for Smart Reply by Google. In their paper, they talk about how they don't always uh, generate these like suggested responses. Uh, a lot of the time, they'll have like a simple model that says like, hey, actually, this is not appropriate. Like, we should not run it on this email. It won't work. And that allows them to just save the user from having terrible results. Okay. Uh, so the, the next question comes from Vinda Prabhu. Also along these lines, how do you... Uh handle bias or outliers in, in a CICD environment where it's, it's a constant loop of uh, integration? Yeah, this is uh, an interesting question because I feel like it's very open. So I'll, my understanding of the question is, is mostly that about outliers in production. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, because the other, the other version that that's, can affect your models is if somehow outliers slip into your training set, then you could train sort of like a wacky model. Um, we can skip that for now because hopefully you could back test that and verify that your model is is not you know acting weirdly because of an outlier in the training set. So if you have outliers um, at inference time, the two methods I just brought up address address them both. So if you have outliers in terms of your input data, you can sort of say like, whoa, you know, we have this sort of a confidence interval where like 95% of values should fall within, you know, like minus two plus three or whatever. Uh, and the, like, we just got 27. So something's definitely wrong. Uh, and then it's sort of up to your application, what you do. This is very application specific. Like maybe you, you uh, need to run another model or maybe you, you can afford the luxury of telling the user like, hey, something's weird. We're just not gonna show you a prediction right now. Like maybe that's fine, right? If it's something that's not critical. Um, and so you can have control flow that says like, oh, if, if we detect an outlier because we've now computed the, the usual distributions, uh, we do something different. We run a different model. Or in the book, I talk about having a backup heuristic where you can say like, hey, if there's an outlier and we're like, are pretty sure that the model is gonna go crazy if we feed it that data, just fall back to a heuristic. Mm -hmm. uh, having such a heuristic is another reason why it's really good to start with the simplest approach because you build your heuristic as like the first baseline that you're hoping to, to beat with your model. But then you can take that heuristic all the way to production saying like, hey, if everything else fails, like if all our data is wrong, if we get these like weird outliers, we can fall back on this heuristic and it should be fine. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I think this has been a very rich interview. This this is one of the last questions, uh, maybe, maybe for a beginner, so to speak. Uh, how, how do you suggest a less creative person, maybe a person like me, find their idea bef if, if, even before they want to take it to production? Many, many people struggle with that. How do I find my million dollar app idea that I want to take to production? That's, that's interesting. And I guess you're, you're trying to find a million dollar idea, which makes this harder, huh? You're I, just trying I, to I mean something. a passion project that, that I can <laughs> burn my GPU credits on. Yeah. As as somebody that's you know not a millionaire, uh, I'm definitely not the resource on finding a million dollar ideas. But as far as passion projects, uh, I do have a few recommendations. Which is, it's kind of like blog posts. Uh, a thing that stops a lot of people from writing blog posts is that you know they say, oh, everything has been written about. You know, and this is something that you know even. Um, the, the, the Romans uh, way back then still complained about, right? They were like, oh, what, what is there to write? We've, we've already written everything that's useful. Uh, why would I bother writing stuff? And, and the truth of the matter is there's still a lot of things uh, to write. There's still a lot of things to build. But also it's okay if the thing you write or the thing you build is your version of something that exists. You know, I'm not saying like plagiarize and lie and steal. I'm saying like you can take a popular app that you enjoy and try to make your version. Like if you like Grammarly and you use it, maybe you make your own Grammarly. It might not make you a million dollars. You know, they probably have thought about the problem for a while, but you're probably gonna think about it from like a different approach and you're probably gonna just have a different take on it. And regardless, it's gonna be super valuable because you know it's a useful product. It's like buy a company that already works, like they can sell it, you know people want it. And so 
you validated that part of it and then you can focus on the part that presumably you actually want to learn which is like okay like how do i ship this mm -hmm. ml uh product how do i get it out there so taking an existing idea that's a good one and just saying like okay you know i'm gonna build my version of like a photo tagging system um i'm gonna build like my version of some like uh speech to text system uh it doesn't matter if you're not the first in fact like you'll be able to lean on existing work a lot to shore up your weaknesses so that you can focus on the most valuable things for you to learn. And you'll be able to like build all this stuff. And then once you've done it once, then you can sit down and think about your million dollar idea because now you, you know how to do it. So you can just yeah. focus purely on the idea. If, if I may contribute to that, uh, I, I don't know how would this translate to engineering because this is more, more of a philosophical take, but uh, for blog posts, what helped me is, uh, there's so many movies out there, even, even the famous, famous ones are just, the same baseline story, right? It's, it's more of a difference yeah. of how, how they narrated it. So look at even the movies coming out. It's, it's almost the same story for every single genre, but yet uh, you enjoy every single one of them. Same, same with blog posts, I would say. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree with that. Awesome. Emmanuel, before we end the call, I'll, I'll have all of your uh, profiles and websites linked in the description. Any special ones that you want to give a shout out to for the lazy listener? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the book just came out. And as I said, I poured sort of my heart and soul into it for, for 18 months. It's truly everything I've learned about machine learning, both from doing it myself for many years and from mentoring hundreds of uh, fellows. And so, you know, I, I couldn't think of anything else to add to these pages. So I think there's a lot of information for anybody that's starting or that has been in the field for a while. So you know, I would just strongly recommend checking it out. If you go to my website, the first chapter is actually available as a PDF for free. And so you can just check it out, see if that's your kind of thing. Um, and if it is, you know, it's on Amazon and O'Reilly.com. Uh, the website is mlpart.com, right? That's right. Okay, awesome. If, if you were to write the next book, uh, do you have any thoughts, any ideas there? What will your next book be about something that you think is missing or something that you'll absolutely enjoy reading? Oh, I think the other thing that I'd love to write about is the engineering side of ML, but I don't think I'm knowledgeable enough to write that book. So I'd like to learn more about sort of the, the robust at scale engineering laws of ML. And mm -hmm. then I'd like to make that more publicly available. Cause I also think it's something that, you know, a small set of engineers at very big companies know and everybody else kind of just doesn't really understand. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and thank you so much for all of your amazing insights. Yeah, thanks so much for, for having me. This was really fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.